great, great pleasure uh, to welcome already all of you uh, here. Uh, I'm Antoine Duval. I'm a senior researcher at the ASEAN Institute, where I coordinate our work on international sports law, but also on business and human rights. And uh, those two areas connect in this uh, in this case. Um, I mean, it's it's obviously uh, uh, a pleasure to to welcome you for this digital uh, discussion on the Casta Semenya decision of the ECTHR. I'm not going to go into details at this point, but I can, I think, safely say that this is a judgment uh, which will have a major impacts uh, on transnational sports law and, and governance. And it's not surprising um, that it uh, triggered a, a lot of interest uh, here uh, today. Uh, we had uh, over 150 uh, registrations uh, uh, in, a, in a week. But also uh, in terms of publications, I think many of you who are interested, we have seen that we have already uh, uh, many blogs and many commentaries that have been published uh, uh, around the case. So it's natural that it's, tr it's triggering this uh, interest, uh, but we're here to discuss a little bit more into detail why it is triggering um, this interest. Um, the event is part of a series of events that we are planning uh, during this academic year with uh, my partner in sports law crime, uh, Daniela uh, Hert, uh, Dr. Daniela Hert, I should say, and who is also a researcher at the, at the Institute uh, around the theme on transnational sports law and governance and gender. And uh, here we are building on, uh, on the shoulder of giants and including our participation in a recent symposium on football feminism and global governance perspectives that was uh, uh, convened by uh, Michelle Kresch, Dr. Michelle Kresch, who is also one of the speakers today and to which we both uh, participated and published uh, an article in, in the International Journal of Constitutional Law, which I encourage you to, to read. Um, and the idea is to engage throughout the year with uh, the manifold ways in which issues linked to gender are subjected to the decisions and regulations of um, international sports governing bodies. Um, and there is obviously no more fitting way to start such a series than with a discussion of the Semenya case, uh, which touches really upon this cardinal distinction uh, in sport between female and male competitions. Um, our next event in the, in the series, which will take place at the end of November, will uh, also be an online discussion and it will be focused on the recent uh, Rubiales case um, and the question of the role of international sports governing bodies, in this case we find FIFA, uh, in combating sexual abuse and harassment in international sports. And in 2024, we are planning events, which will be also in person in The Hague at the Arsene Institute. Um, so please uh, stay tuned, uh, follow uh, um, our newsletter and our blog for uh, more information on these events. Now let me turn to uh, today's discussion. Um, and I will uh, obviously not discuss the case myself because I'm joined with uh, my three brilliant researchers who have all three worked on the case. Um, first, as I mentioned, Dr. Daniela Hurt, uh, my colleague here at Arce and the head of education and research at the Center for Sport and Human Rights. Uh, she's a well-known academic expert and, and writer in the field at the intersection between human rights and, and sports and the governance of sports. And Daniela will provide a general introduction to the case, the factual background, the, and the procedural road uh, up to the decision of the, of the court. Uh, and then after Daniela's introduction, we have two uh, commentators um, on the case directly, Michel uh, Kresch, Dr. Michel Kresch and Dr. Lena Holzer, who will uh, both give their take on the judgment, um, its implications for Casta Semenya, for the regulation of uh, the participation of intersex athletes in international sports. And I hope, I think and hope also for the governance of sports in general, because this case goes beyond the issue of just 
and the participation of athletes, of intersex athletes in, in sporting competition. Michel is a Bigelow, I hope I'm not mispronouncing Bigelow fellow and lecturer in law at the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, she defended her dissertation at NYU on the regulation of gender by world athletics, um, in which you examined the evolution in these regulatory approaches over the past century um, and the meaning that was given to the norm of gender equality. Uh, it's also important to note in the context of the discussion that Michelle was directly involved in the case. She was uh, retained as a consultant by counsel for Casta Semenya in the proceedings before the CAS and contributed to the submissions of several third party interveners in the proceedings before the ACTHR, as well as the OHCHR report, which is, uh, as you will have noted, cited in the judgment. Lena is an assistant professor in gender, race, and the law at the University of Cambridge. Um, you will have I'm the author of an article that um, titled What Does It Mean to Be a Woman in Sports? An analysis of the jurisprudence of the Court of Arbitration for Sports, which was focused on the Seminia case also, and of a number of blogs commenting on the case at the different stages of the case. So we've been really uh, following extremely closely uh, this case since the beginning. So we will have, after these interventions, an opportunity for an open Q&A uh, in which you will have uh, the possibility to ask questions either directly or via the chat. Until then, I really strongly urge you, beg you to ensure that microphones stay off. Uh, we have a very horizontal Zoom meeting, but it means that you have also a real responsibility to make sure that the uh, mics uh, stay uh, quiet. Um, so, without further ado, I will uh, hand over the floor to, to Daniela for the introduction, and then we will move to Michelle and then Lena. Yes, thank you, Antoine. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, and also from my side, thanks to all of you for showing up for this first um, event that we are organizing today as part of this series on gender and sports. So, so very exciting, but also big thank you to the speakers for making the time to, to be here today. What I'll try to do now in the next couple of minutes, just to give a short introduction to the case and the context around it. Obviously, I'm not the expert here. I did some work around it, but definitely Lena and Michelle are, are the experts. So we're very grateful to have them here with us um, and they can go in much more detail, uh, but we felt like it is important to situate um, what they are going to say and, and their reflections by means of providing this contextual background in the beginning. And before I actually get to the facts of the case, before the European Court of Human Rights, which is what we're here to discuss, I, I actually quickly wanted to just provide a more general introduction into you know, the, the subject, the, the why we're here, the issue, if you want to call it that way. And we are talking about a case today that is basically the result of, of a legal battle that um, the professional athlete Custer Semenya, South African Olympic gold medalist, has been fighting against World Athletics, which is the International Federation um, of the Sport of Athletics. And this fight concerns um, certain rules that World Athletics had issued to regulate the participation of, of female athletes with differences of sexual development, um, and we can call them DSD rules or DSD regulations. Uh, and then the person considered as, as DSD athlete or an athlete considered as DSD athlete means that basically the, the, the sexual development is, is different to those of most others. And as a result, uh, female DSD athletes can naturally produce more testosterone in their bodies than uh, women uh, without um, this condition. According to World Athletics, this brings them a certain advantage in certain competitions or certain distances. Hence, uh, this need from World Athletics to regulate. Uh, and the DSD regulations, um, what they did is they ban um, athletes with DSD or female athletes with DSD from taking part in certain races and ask them to lower their testosterone levels through some form of me medical treatment if they want to participate uh, in these competitions. Um, I also want to stress that the case we're talking about now was actually about challenging rules, uh, these DSD regulations that were issued, I think, in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
these rules, just as a side note, had replaced another set of rules that back then regulated athletes or the participation um, of athletes with higher androgen levels. Um, and these as well, these rules has as, have as well been challenged by an athlete affected by them due to chance, uh, who, who many of you will know. Um, and her case was actually partially upheld by the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Um, so yeah, interesting side information here maybe, but um, what then happened is that World Athletics came with the new rules in 2018 and they form the basis of, of the case now. Um, but just for your information, in the meantime, I think we're dealing with another set of rules. So World Athletics had again issued a new set of rules, which as I understood are, are even more, more straight. But back to the case. Um, so after Castro Semenya actually had won the World Championships in 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 800 meter running three times, plus I think a gold summer uh, gold at the Summer Olympics um, in in 2016, uh, and I think even in 2012, World Athletics had issued these new eligibility rules, the DSD regulations, which require female athletes with DSD to have a certain testosterone levels in order to be able to compete. And Semenya, who identified as a DSD athlete would have then been required to undergo medical treatment to lower her testosterone and be able to compete. But based on her previous negative experience um, of actually undergoing this, um, she refused to do that and decided instead to challenge these rules before the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Um, so in April 2019, the cast, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, dismissed um, Semenya's claims against these regulations or against World, Ath World Athletics, arguing that they were discriminatory, but presented a necessary, reasonable and proportionate measure of World Athletics to ensure a fair competition in their sport. Um, and I think the panel then admitted that, yes, it hasn't found um, the issue in this case easy to decide, but nevertheless, they decided that the rules can be upheld for achieving the aim of what is described as integrity of, of female athletics and the upholding of the protected class of female athletes in, in certain events. What then happened is that Semenya appealed this decision at the Swiss Federal Court, the only way basically to appeal um, these, these awards or these decisions, which then in 2020 rejected the appeal, finding that Semenya did not sufficiently show that the CAS award vi violates fundamental and widely recognized principles of public order. That was the basis of, of, of the appeal, one of the few options based on which you can appeal CAS decisions at the Swiss Federal Tribunal. So in short, what happened is that the Swiss Federal uh, Tribunal or Swiss Federal Court agreed with the CAS that fairness in sport is a legitimate concern and forms a central principle of, of sporting competitions. Then the only possibility for Semenya and her legal team to challenge this decision was basically to go to the European Court of Human Rights and file an application against Switzerland, uh, arguing that Switzerland had breached its obligations under the European Convention of Human Rights in the way it played a role in reviewing the regulations, right? So obviously Switzerland did not play a role in actually designing and issuing these, these DSD regulations, but it did play a role in the whole review process, the challenge that Castor Semenya started. And in February 2021, the application was filed relying on Article 14, which is the prohibition of discrimination, together with Article 8, the respect for private life in the European Convention on Human Rights, also relying on Article 13, the right to effective remedy taken together with Articles 3, prohibition of inhuman or degrading treatment, Article 8 and 14, and also relying on Article 3, Article 6, the right to fair hearing, and 8 separately. Then, um, just to stress again how the court um, reached the decision and, and what arguments were uh, used and, and expressed will be, I guess, discussed more by, by uh, the speakers that, that come next. Um, so I'll just briefly focus on the conclusion that was reached and then and then hand over. So in July this year, then the court came to the conclusion that Switzerland had uh, overstepped a narrow margin of uh, appreciation that is applied in cases of discrimination based on sex and sexual character characteristics by actually not ensuring sufficient uh, safeguards to allow Semenya to have her complaints um, examined. So in other words, the court argued that due to the specific circumstances of the discrimination in this case, the margin of, of appreciation was, was different and Switzerland failed to protect her rights by exceeding that, that margin. 
Um, what that meant is that the court found a violation of Article 14, together with Article 8, um, and argued that the fact that both Cass and the Swiss Federal Court had failed to respond in an effective manner to the complaints she raised, um, the remedies available to Semenya cannot be considered effective. So they also found a violation of Article 13 in relation to Article 14 taken together with Article 8. The complaint under Article 3 was declared inadmissible. Final note now, and this is something that, that uh, one of our speakers, Michelle, alerted me to before this, uh, or right at the start of this meeting. This was a chamber judgment, meaning that there could have been a grand chamber judgment following, but apparently the deadline for, for, for application to that has passed, which is, uh, yeah, interesting that that didn't happen. And I'll stop here and hand over now to uh, Michelle, Dr. Michelle Gresh as our first speaker. Sorry. Thank you, Daniela. Um, so yeah, I'm very glad to participate in this discussion about a, a case, or I guess I should say a, a long series of cases that I've been following for many years and that I think certainly won't be the last on this issue. Um, and there are, of course, many important and interesting, interesting elements and implications of the European Court of Human Rights decision in this case. I think many of these flow from the fact that the decision is sort of the first time that we have seen a, a judicial assessment of whether World Athletics DSD regulations comply with some body of international human rights law. I think it's very notable that, and we see this as central to the decision, that neither the Court of Arbitration for Sport nor the Swiss Federal Court you know, directly evaluated the DSD regulations in light of international human rights law. Both sort of sidestepped this issue um, in various ways, and now the European Court of Human Rights has basically said that this approach can no longer stand. Um, so I'll start by saying a little bit about what the court has said needs to change, uh, but I'll also sort of explain why I think these changes don't tell us exactly, you know, what is going to be permissible or not in terms of female elig eligibility regulations or, you know, in terms of whether and how we can police the distinction between men and women's categories of competition. Um, part of this is because the application before the European Court of Human Rights was, as Daniela mentioned, against Switzerland, which did not itself make the regulations at issue. This private sport governing body headquartered in Monaco did. Um, but another reason, a related reason, is that the court's decision had a um, procedural rather than substantive focus. Um, and so this makes the sort of immediate impact of the court's decision maybe a little unclear. Uh, so I, I'm going to come to sort of focus my comments on what future litigation might look like going forward from this landmark decision. You know, in other words, I think I think that's where we might see the biggest impact. Um, so first, I think it really is significant that the court did not conduct its own full assessment of whether the DSD regulations violate the European Convention. Uh, this remains an open question, even if we might read the court's decision to sort of be leaning one way. Um, which we can maybe talk more about. Um, but basically the court sort of instead found that Semenya was not afforded sufficient institutional and procedural safeguards in Switzerland um, to have her complaint examined effectively. So this is a, a procedural failure uh, that resulted in, in a violation of, of the articles of the convention Daniela mentioned. Um, so I, I think in, in focusing more on procedural failures, the court is essentially saying that the current system of sport dispute settlement, so that's consisting of what is forced arbitration before the Court of Arbitration for Sport, followed by an appeal to the Swiss Federal Court on very limited grounds, is, is inadequate as it's currently carried out. Um, and this inadequacy stems from the fact that I opened with that, that neither of these judicial bodies, neither the, the CAS or the Swiss Federal Court, in, um, engaged in a sufficiently thorough examination of Semenya's human rights claims. Um, this raises really interesting questions about how Switzerland can remedy these failures of both the, the CAS and the Swiss court. Um, overall, the court focuses less on the CAS uh, and notes that because it's a, a non-state entity, the, the CAS is not sort of directly bound by human rights treaties, but the court still finds that the court's sort of avoidance of human rights law contributed to the lack of, of institutional and procedural safeguards afforded in Switzerland. 
um, it points in particular to the fact that the CAS sort of on one hand identified all these concerns about the scientific validity, validity and harmful effects of the DSD regulations, but then just went ahead and upheld the regulations anyway. So the, the court is basically saying something was missing here. The, the CAS failed to sort of thoroughly analyze whether the regulations were justified and importantly justified in light of the European Convention. Um, so there are certainly ways that the CAS could now, you know, see this decision and, and start to consider substantive convention rights in its decision. And maybe we can get into this in the Q&A or other speakers might mention it. But strictly speaking, Switzerland doesn't control the Court of Arbitration for Sport as an international arbitral tribunal. Um, so maybe, you know, that's maybe why more focus in the decision is on the Swiss federal court, which is, you know, very clearly the responsibility of Switzerland. Um, and the, the problem here was, um, as Daniela noted, that the, the Swiss court's considerations of Semenya's appeal was really limited to assessing whether the caste decision was incompatible with Swiss public policy. This is a concept that the Swiss court generally interprets very narrowly. Uh, and the European Court of Human Rights said this narrow interpretation basically led the Swiss court astray in Semenya's case. It, it led the, the Swiss court to affirm the caste decision without engaging in its own examination of the issues that were in dispute. Um, so, yeah, in other words, a, a sort of detailed examination of the complaint and a weighing of the relevant interests at stake, um, as the European Convention on Human Rights requires, was not done because that kind of review doesn't fall within the Swiss court's sort of narrow notion of public policy. Um, so I guess the upshot of this part of the court's decision is that the Swiss court sort of has to interpret the notion of public policy more broadly to include the human rights guarantees enshrined in the European Convention. Um, and again, I think there are different ways we can imagine that Switzerland might achieve this and, and we'll see what Switzerland proposes eventually. Um, but I, I do think that these, and I do think these changes could be significant in terms of, you know, how cases challenging female eligibility regulations and other cases that raise human rights concerns are decided. Um, but like I said at the beginning, I think procedural sort of fixes won't necessarily change outcomes substantively. So I just want to point to sort of one way that the substantive consideration of these kinds of cases might change after this decision from the European Court. Um, and this relates to sort of the type of arguments and the role of other actors, particularly relevant experts, that might sort of shape the outcome of these cases. Um, so, so throughout the decision, the European Court of Human Rights emphasizes points made or substanti substantiated by various experts, um, experts in gender and sport, in medical ethics, in human rights, and I guess especially at the intersection of these topics. Uh, so just to give an example, the court sort of emphasizes that Semenya was faced with a choice that wasn't a real choice at all. So take testosterone suppressants or renounce her profession. And this is a point made perhaps most clearly by Human Rights Watch, who was a third party intervener in the case and, and published a major report on how female eligibility regulations impact athletes in the real world. Um, but even beyond that, the court directly cites in, in the decision a number of experts when it's sort of pointing to the facts and the arguments that it says the Swiss federal court and the CAS sort of failed to ad adequately consider. So I think these include points made in reports by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, uh, the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Also, um, they point to points made in the amicus brief submitted by the Global Health Just Par Justice Partnership and the World Medical Association. So the court is basically directly saying that, you know, the concerns raised by these organizations should have formed part of the analysis of Semenya's complaints in Switzerland. Um, the court also accepted third party interventions from actually a much wider range of other organizations, which I won't list now, um, but organizations that have sort of repeatedly expressed human rights concerns about the DSD regulations. And my point here is that the European Court of Human Rights did not just, you know, decide itself to consider what these various experts have said, but really emphasize that this is actually the type of information that courts in Switzerland have to consider if they are going to comply with the European Convention. Um, you know, 
I'll put it this way. So like the, the fact that the evidence and arguments put forth by these expert groups were not thoroughly considered is sort of a key reason that the European court said Switzerland violated the convention. Um, and I think this is one reason this is significant is that it sort of undermines world athletics claim that the existing decisions of the court of arbitration for sport and the Swiss federal court, you know, confirm that the regulations do not run afoul of human rights. That is now at the very least an open question because the, the European Court of Human Rights has said that actually neither of those courts conducted a thorough human rights analysis. Uh, so that means I think that we can expect more legal challenges brought by athletes who are excluded by sport based on their sex characteristics um, or for other human rights related reasons. And uh, that those athletes and their legal teams can probably be more assured that arguments you know, referencing international human rights law and the um, opinions of experts in this field won't be sort of tossed aside as they largely have been up until the decision of the European court. Um, so basically they, they should bring those arguments and the experts to substantiate them. And then you know, the sport governing bodies in turn will probably have to be prepared to engage in that type of legal argument, uh, which I don't think has been central or to date. Um, so I'll just end by noting that a couple of the judges who wrote sort of separate opinions um, said quite directly that World Athletics DSD regulations are incompatible with the European, European Convention um, or that Switzerland materially violated Semenya's substantive rights in upholding those regulations. But since the majority of the court did not go that far, sort of opting instead to focus on the procedural level, it does seem very possible to me, although I'd be interested to hear what other speakers think, um, that this issue could come before the European Court of Human Rights again, and that the court might be forced to make a more substantively rather than procedurally focused decision. Um, and I say this because even if you know procedural safeguards in Switzerland are, are improved, like the court says they should be, um, the court also said pretty clearly that the margin of appreciation is narrow in cases where a difference of treatment is based on a person's a person's sexual characteristics, or where a particularly important facet of a person's existence or identity is at stake, as in the case of these female eligibility regulation um, challenges. So I guess while the European Court's decision is, is somewhat conservative and, and gives Switzerland, and, and by the same token, the CAS and uh, the, the Swiss Federal Court sort of another chance to do better, I think it's also sort of opening the door for more cases to be brought and, if necessary, appealed all the way back up to the, the European Court of Human Rights, if necessary. Um, so I'll stop there for now um, and looking forward to discussion. Thank you, Michelle. And maybe before I hand over to Lena, two points I think that are relevant in, in directly to, to your considerations. One thing is, here in this case, the case went very fast. Uh, we had the decision of the European Court of Human Rights what, one year and a half after the case was submitted or something like that. Um, this is not very usual. Um, and the time for the next case to come might be counted in decades or in a decade. So by punting a question, you're also punting a question for 10 years, but potentially. And this is also something that, that is relevant probably from a judicial policy perspective to uh, the choice between addressing the question substantially or procedurally. Um, and, and one final point of, about the discussion that is going on in the, in, in, in the, the chat room. Um, I, I think the deadline passed this week. I haven't seen any um, public acknowledgement of an appeal, uh, but indeed we cannot exclude that one has happened entirely, though it seems strange that it, this wouldn't have been communicated by one of the parties that is interested, for example, the World Athletics or uh, the, the Court of Arbitration for Sports to the media, that there is still that appeal possible. So I, I would be surprised that there is an appeal that is uh, invisible to us at this point, but we cannot exclude it entirely. Lena, the floor is yours. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thanks for inviting me. I'm really happy to be able to continue the discussion, which we started also a few years ago. Um, so I think it has been already said that this is a really significant uh, decision in international sports law and also in the realm of international human rights law. And I think it will make history, especially also with um, what Michelle just said, that it opens the door for more human rights claims in relation to sports at the European Court of Human Rights. Um, so I think there are many different interesting angles one could take. Um, today I will try to focus on kind of the implications of the judgment on the use of the DSD regulations or similar rules in international sports and also rely or touch upon the broader significance on human rights in international sports. Um, so I think what has been already kind of clearly stated, the decision is really focusing on this absence of procedural and institutional safeguards that would protect Semenya and other women in her situations from kind of potential discrimination. Um, and what I want to do first is to see how did the court kind of came to this decision, how did it find a violation of um, Article 14 taken together with Article 8 and Article 13 taken together with Article 14 um, and 8. Um, so maybe to just recall, like Switzerland's main claim was that it had very, that the SFT, the Swiss Federal Tribunal, has very limited jurisdiction to set aside the CAS award. So based on Swiss private international law, only on very few procedural grounds or on this ground that an award violates Swiss public policy, the SFT would set aside an international award. But it was also the SFT itself, which kind of construed this notion of Swiss public policy very narrow through its jurisprudence. Um, and in fact, if you look at some data which has been collected by DASA and Watch the Wits, um, you can see that within 30 years from, so from 1989 to 2019, the SFT has not set aside a single CAS award based on the ground of Swiss public policy. Um, so in this regard, you can see that it's the SFT is not really an, a remedy for athletes, and it also doesn't claim really to be like an appeal court for athletes. Um, that's not how it sees its function. Um, but the decision by the European Court of Human Rights did recognize that even though like under Swiss private international law, the jurisdiction of the Swiss federal tribunal is very narrow, this does not mean that Switzerland can dispose itself from the complete from the obligation to kind of comply with the, EC, with the ECHR when it is reviewing cast decisions. Um, so in this regard, it kind of reiterated what it already held in, in Mutu and Pechstein that um, since it was kind of forced arbitration for Semenya, Semenya did not have another alternative than going to the cast and then going to the SFT in order to challenge the DSD regulations. That also meant that uh, some provisions at least from the ECHR have to apply. And I think one core takeaway is that the ECTHR recognized that the discriminatory treatment against athletes by private sport federations, which is then which was legitimated or could be legitimated by the CAS, um, can be covered or is covered by the prohibition of discrimination of Article 14. So in this regard, um, it recognized the positive obligations of Switzerland to, to create necessary mechanisms to remedy discrimination against sports people committed by sport federations. And what I also found significant is that it stressed that there was a power hierarchy between athletes and international sport federations. And this power hierarchy has to be taken into account when the SFT is analyzing whether the protections from horizontal discriminations are very sufficient through the CAS. Um, in this regard, it also held that given the difference in power inequalities between sport federations and athletes, um, it's kind of unclear why professional athletes should be afforded less judicial protection than people exercising another profession. And I think one aspect which I see of the judgment, which is quite essential also from kind of the perspective of gender justice, um, is that the, the ECTHR recognized that the SFT and the CAS both failed to consider the severity of the side effects which are created through the hormone treatment, um, which is prescribed to athletes in order to comply with the DSD regulations. So it kind of refused to accept this argument, which World Athletic put for, puts forward, that um, it's proportionate to ask the athletes to, um, to take hormone treatment in order to comply with the DSD regulations. Um, 
based on the fact that, that millions of women um, take conventional oral contraceptives, which is similar to the hormone treatment which the affected athletes would get described. And I think this is important because um, I think it delegitimizes this argument that the regulation of women's bodies through hormones is a very like normalized and naturalized process and like not a big deal. Um, I think on that note also, what I found striking is that it recognized that the DST regulations do not provide a real choice. I think Michelle already mentioned that in the sense that it, um, it argued that the athletes, it's not a real choice to having to decide between um, being able to continue one's profession or undertaking hormone treatment, which could potentially impair one's physical and psychological health or integrity. And I think that understanding of what is choice or what is consent um, by the European Court of Human Rights is more nuanced than the one which was put forward by, by World Athletics. And it also indirectly um, recognizes kind of the class specific effects of the DSD regulations, since specifically also women from socioeconomic difficult situations um, do not have a real choice between either taking hormone treatment or losing their profession and also their livelihoods and maybe the livelihoods of their families as well. Um, so I think due to this like different problematic aspects of the DSD regulations, the, the European Court of Human Rights held that Switzerland had failed to comply with the ECHR because it did not substantively review or evaluate the CAST decision. So again, I think as has been already stressed, it did not go so far to actually pronounce itself on the substance of the DSD regulations themselves, but it did raise a few like critical elements in the DSD regulations, which then led to the fact that it argued that substantive evaluation of the CAST decision is necessary um, and, in, and whether these CAST decisions are in compliance with the ECHR. But I think then, I think in the media and a lot of debate has been on, so what does this ruling then exactly mean for, for example, World Athletics or for the DSD regulations themselves? And I think World Athletics, um, was quite quick after the judgment came out to inform the public that it will not repeal its current DST regulations. Um, and it, it also stated that it will ask Switzerland to request a referral to the Grand Chamber, which might have not happened, or Switzerland probably might have not requested this referral. Um, so that means that until now, like the DST regulations are still in place and so many and other affected athletes will not be able to com compete in the restricted events. And so I think now what I want to do is to look a bit more, what are other like indications by judges provided that if they would be addressed with a similar question, maybe in 10 years time, um, what, is there any indication what, what would they hold about the, the nature of the DE reg regulations themselves and whether they are discriminatory themselves? Um, so I think as been, has been already said, some of the dissenting opinions um, held that it's, it was a bit of like a lost opportunity to not issue a ruling under Article 8 taken alone and under Article 3, because this avoided to look at the substantive issues, whether the DSD regulations put in, like violate the right to bodily integrity or constitute inhuman treatment or ill treatment. Um, but there are some other like crucial aspects. So first of all, like the, the judges from the European Court of Human Rights recognized for the first time that discrimination based on sex characteristics is prohibited by Article 14 of the ECHR, either on the grounds of sex, which is listed in the Article 14, or based on the ground of genetic characteristics, which previous judgments have recognized as being covered by Article 14. So that means that Semenya's exclusion from sports due to her variations in sex characteristics could be considered as constituting discrimination under the ECHR. And, and the, the judges also said that the procedural and institutional safeguards are especially needed because Semenya's complaints concern substantiated and credible claims of discrimination. And it held that a differentiation in treatment based on sex must be justified by very weighty reasons. So the bar for being able to exclude legally a person based on their sex characteristics is thus quite high. And that's, I think, is relevant for um, future judgments and also for regulations by sport federations to consider that the bar of excluding persons based on their sex characteristics from sports 
is relatively high. Um, the, as has been already said, the court also kind of stressed that there is an, an absence of sufficient scientific evidence, and that really relates to the heart of the disputes on the legality of the world athletics. Um, it, it also, in this regard, recognized the fact that there were a lot of expert witnesses testifying also for Semenya at the CAS and also providing expert, uh, expert testimonies um, on this interplay between gender and sports at the European Court of Human Rights, but even before. Um, and I think another element is that we've already mentioned that it really like recognized the severity of the side effects of the DSD regulations. And it held that the DSD re regulations really involve high personal stakes, which potentially jeopardize Semenya's possibility to practice her profession. So that needs to be into, uh, taken into account by rule makers, but also by dispute settlement bodies when they are undertaking this balancing exercise that um, high personal stakes are involved in, in, in the matter. So I think the, the judge, judges at least were quite well aware of some problematic elements of the nature of these deregulations. Um, and what is definitely the case is that you can, it, this SFT, in the future, we'll have to take into account some of these elements when it is asked again um, to, to evaluate whether the CAS has um, included human rights concerns sufficiently in its rulings. So I think in this regard, it's clear that like Switzerland was the respondent states and Switzerland is also the one who has to remedy um, violations which have occurred. But I do think that um, the judgment will have also impacts on the rules of um, sport federations in the future because it really showed that there are limits to the regu regulatory power of sport federations or also private dispute settlement mechanisms such as the CAS. Um, and I think here we can also see the strong like human rights implications that are caused by, by the judgment itself. Okay, I think that's it from my side. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to any questions and comments. Thank you, Nina. Um, maybe Daniela, you wanted to add a few things? Uh, or... We can add a few things or more like summarize a little bit. Um, I think what, what both Michelle and, and Lena said. And I think it just comes down to, at least from my point now, and I'm, I'm, I mean, there were a lot of things said and um, I, I agree with, with everything and very interesting analysis. So thank you both. But I think probably what we can all agree on that, yes, this is a landmark case with, with you know, high interest from different stakeholder groups with significant points being made by the court, um, points that actually, you know, the CAS and also SFT have not really considered, have ignored, brushed over, such as in-depth assessments of, for instance, proportionality, considering side effects of, you know, taking medical treatments to lower testosterone, as, as mentioned uh, by Lena. Um, but we also, I think, have to be aware that, that it doesn't change anything as of now, overnight. Uh, neither does it help Semenya now to compete again, nor does it have a direct effect of it on how sports bodies are, are um, making their rules from now on, basically. But I also think I, I agree with, with also what Michelle said, is that it does open doors for other cases to come even though we don't know when they would come, but still it does. And I think this is something that is really needed. Um, if we look at the remedy landscape for, for um, human rights abuses happening in the sporting context, we just know that there are severe problems. You know, there is, um, there are very narrow grounds for, for appeal for athletes in particular, right? We, we've heard it or we've seen it in this case, in this trajectory of you know the series of cases how it all developed but more generally there's a lack of available mechanisms effective mechanisms um, and I think that's also indirectly recognized by the courts through the way it's kind of accepted jurisdiction and saying that if it wouldn't it would include exclude a certain group from having access to the court so I think all in all um, as it stands now we, we don't know 100% whether or not there is this appeal but um, I think yes this is if you want to call it a win for a sport and human rights movement. Um, but yeah, we also shouldn't, um, you know, we have to be cautious and recognize that this is a lengthy and costly battle that, that you know, Castor Semenya fought in this case and also in, in other cases, if we look at, also, for instance, again, the Juju Chan case, and this doesn't come without its consequences. And also it's certainly not the case for all athletes that they have the means to go through this, 
cycle and through through this trajectory. Um, yeah, these were just my little additions to the brilliant points that the others already made. Thanks, Antoine. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniela, also for this input. Maybe before I, I give the floor to uh, to the audience, I, I will add a few a few thoughts of mine, or at least maybe also re um, analytically restructure a little bit the um, different uh, elements that have been put on the table in terms of the impact of the judgment. And I think we can um, see its impact on four levels, going from the micro to the macro. And the micro level first impact on Casta Semenya, the claimant. Um, the claimant, in, in the end, will probably not get to participate in high-level athletics competitions in the coming year or potentially years. I mean, she has not obtained that right until now. And it seems to me that the world athletics is um, betting on outrunning her, um, which might very well happen and which happens a lot in sports. I mean, Claudia Pestein is another name that comes to mind. She has been of such a longevity that it was impossible to outrun her, but she had to compete until her 50s to be able to do that. Um, this would probably not be the case uh, with Casta Semenya. And in the end, this is a victory, but this is also a painful one because it will probably not turn into a victory that enables her to uh, exercise her profession again. So uh, let's let's be conscious about that. that and that's a, the micro and the more personal impact directly of, of the judgment is, is limited for her. Uh, second, um, I think this judgment has an impact as well at the level of the regulation of the participation of intersex, but also potentially transgender athletes in female competitions. So here, and here the question is about the depth of, this, of the implications. Um, we haven't really touched on the transgender uh, question yet, but it is in a way differentiated in the judgment, which I think is a hint at where the European court might stand if that question were posed to the court. Um, but on the intersex, uh, um, on the participation of intersex athletes, I think the review is procedural, but also quite substantial. Uh, let's not be fooled. I mean, there are a lot of substantial considerations that make it more than procedural, that make it an expectation that the bar to meet that procedural requirement is super high in terms of the type of evidence and balancing that is expected from both the Swiss Federal Tribunal and the Court of Arbitration for Sports. So the, the, the message is packaged in a procedural language, but it has a lot of substantial dimension. And here I think there is a strong message, but also one that is to some extent cautious in the sense that they did, the judges didn't want to go on the uh, terrain of substance, but still a strong message that they believe that this is such a restrictive and aggressive way to regulate fairness in sports that they would need to see a, high, a really highly substantiated justification for these type of rules to stand. And now the onus will be on future complainants and on the CAS and the S and the Swiss Federal Tribunal to meet that onus. Uh, whether they will or not be able to do so, we will see. And in any case, we will see only in potentially 10 years when a similar case comes back to the court. And then there is an even more macro impact, which is the impact of the judgment on transnational sports governance and transnational sports law and the structure uh, uh, of uh, that governance and the role of the CAS and the role of the Swiss Federal Tribunal. Until now, the Swiss Federal Tribunal, and you have, I mean, this is something um, that, that I've been working a lot on, has been uh, a gatekeeper to ensure that the CAS is the final speaker of the Lex Sportiva. Uh, has the final word. The Swiss Federal Tribunal has happily interpreted Swiss private international law in a way that is so narrow 
on the appeal grounds that you cannot appeal a CAS award successfully. However, it has interpreted the Swiss private international law on the consent to arbitration in a very generous way. So here has been the paradox until now. And this is the paradox that is targeted at the European Court of Human Rights in this judgment, was already at the center of the Pechstein judgment and is in extremely important to unravel for sports governance and sports regulation. Because here, what the court says is, you cannot have your cake and eat it. Yeah? Because here it says, either we accept arbitration in a situation where there is no consent. But if we do so, then we need to be very serious about reviewing that arbitration. And until now, you have been all but that serious. This is the main message of this decision as well. And that goes way beyond the issue of intersex athletes. It will touch upon the entire world of governance and regulation of sports. And it will imply that a lot of claimants are going to try to use human rights, but also the CAS and the Swiss Federal Tribunal will have to grapple much more with these arguments, will have to justify much more. And potentially, many more cases will end up before the European Court of Human Rights, probably will not be decided as fast. And then the final level, which is less important for our discussion, but I think is important overall, this is also about the role of human rights and constitutionalization in transnational private governance, uh, in the rise in our world of regulators which are private, but which are private and enabled by state. And basically what's happening here is, I think the court is saying to Switzerland, you cannot hide behind the fact that this is a private actor that you have enabled to act as a regulator to say that you don't have any responsibility. Uh, if through your private law, you enable actors to actually threaten the human rights of others, you also need to take responsibility for that. And this is obviously the much broader and much wider legacy of the judgment that goes beyond uh, the realm of sport. So this is how I see the impact of this judgment. Um, and I do think that a lot will depend on whether the European Court of Human Rights is ready to take on cases in the future and to continue to police and pressure the Swiss Federal Tribunal and the CAS in the way they exercise reviews on transnational sports governance. Okay, now I think we are ready for the questions. 